Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Vicky. How are you today? Michael, I'm doing really well, thank you. Glad to be here. Oh, great for you to come on the show. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing your story, that's for sure. And you're in the beautiful Germany, I understand, as well. I am. I am in beautiful Frankfurt, Germany. It's very warm here right now. Uh, lovely summer in Germany, but uh, yeah, enjoying it very much. Oh, my God. Yeah, don't talk to me about the warm weather. I'm in the United Kingdom and we've had the hottest weather in history for the United Kingdom uh, earlier this week. It was dreadful. <laughs> I love warm weather, but not that kind of warm weather. No, no, it was not nice at all. So, um, yeah, this is the way things are going now. I mean, I, I feel for people in the southern countries. But anyway, enough about the weather. We want to hear your story. So, Vicky, I'm going to open it with a really open question, and that is tell us a little bit about your story and how you got to where you are today. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, I started in um, the US, I'm American. Uh, I grew up in Virginia in a yeah, very normal middle-class family, nothing really special about the way that I, that I grew up or, or my early experiences. Uh, but then after going to college in Virginia for business and marketing, I decided to pursue a dream that I had since I was a child. I'd always wanted to live in California at the beach. Yes. So after college, I moved cross country to Los Angeles, put everything I owned in the car and just drove uh, and uh, moved to Los Angeles. And that was you know, one of the best decisions I've ever made. I really loved it there. It took me a while to get my, um, my feet under me, you know, you know, get settled and find a job and, and uh, but I found a job at a marketing agency there. And then shortly after that, I ended up founding my own training and coaching agency that I ran in Los Angeles for, for 10 years. Um, really enjoyed the work that we were doing with a lot of different um, corporate clients, Fortune 500 companies uh, there to help people improve their performance, to help them be better salespeople or better managers or you know, whatever their, their role was. Yes. Uh, then I, I had some changes in my personal life, um, you know, while I was running that business towards uh, the end of that period and was really thinking about, OK, well, what are my next steps? What do I want to do? And that's when I decided, well, now's the chance if I if I ever want to pursue another dream I had of moving to Europe. Now's right. the time. So that's how I ended up in Germany is I gave the business to a partner, basically handed everything over and said, I'm going for it. I'm going to make this change and move to Europe uh, and came to actually intended to go to Spain, uh, but ended up finding work in uh, Germany. And that was in 2015. And uh, so I've been here ever since. Uh, wow. Did very similar work to what I was doing in the U.S., doing uh, corporate training and, and coaching um, right up into the pandemic, and then everything changed again. <laughs> okay, I've, I've, I've some questions before you carry on from the pandemic onwards. Um, why Europe? What was it about Europe that attracted you? It was, I had traveled a little bit, you know, over the course of that, you know, time in my life between college and, and running my business. And I, in the trips that I had taken to Europe, I just really loved the, the culture and the lifestyle and the, the history. I mean, obviously, you know, the history in Europe is, is much longer than, you know, than what we have in the U.S. And um, it just everything about it fascinated me, but especially the, the quality of life was, was something that I was really impressed by. Uh, people's approach to work, people's approach to um, holiday and friendships and family. And it was something that appealed to me, I think starting from about 20, 2010, I really started like 
paying attention to that and sort of wanting more and more of that. And so then ultimately in 2014, I decided to make the jump. Ah, oh, wow. Okay. And were you like, could you speak other languages when you were in the US? Sadly, that is actually one of my biggest regrets. I took, I studied lots of languages. I studied French, I studied Japanese, right. I studied Spanish. Um, but you know, in the US we study languages and then we don't ever use them for anything. Um, and yes. even living in, living in California, I mean, it would have been the perfect opportunity to, to become fluent in Spanish. Um, yes. But I didn't, I didn't take advantage of the opportunity. So no, I, I moved to Europe um, speaking only English, which is, I, I noticed quickly um, that I was in the minority speaking only one language because of course, you know, everybody here speaks two or three or four or more languages um, often often in the same sentence or in the same conversation. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I felt, um, I felt very um, under accomplished in that area when I moved here. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I think, that's why I think it's even braver to go to a country or a continent where you where yeah you can get by with English because I mean I was born in the Netherlands right but we had to compulsorily is that a word even it was compulsory mm -hmm. to 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 learn two languages that was Dutch and English because no but very few countries around the world speak Dutch mm -hmm. and but you know most countries will get you can get by with English and of course I ended up in England which was useful from that point of view <laughs> but if you haven't had any exposure to a language and moving to a country where you can't speak the language that's really brave to do Vicky it, well, it's interesting that you use that word. A lot of people, a lot of people have, have used that word describing what I what I did, brave. Um, and I never felt brave, crazy maybe, but but yes. brave was, was not. Um, but there's this, I, I'll tell you, you know, as the story goes further, I'll tell you that that specific um, comment from people actually inspired me to to do something else, which has uh, led to to where I am now. Um, but I didn't feel brave. I just felt, like I said, I felt underprepared. Um, I intended to move to Spain. And so I had started studying Spanish and I had even spent six weeks in Spain sort of as a trial run. And so I had friends there and I had gotten familiar with the neighborhood that I wanted to live in and could get around with basic Spanish. And so I had prepared to move to Spain. And then when I made the move, I hadn't quite realized how difficult it would be to get a visa and permission to work and, and to actually find work, yes. especially without, without language skills, right? I mean, that, that yeah. was a huge advantage. Um, so I got very lucky, actually. I got very fortunate in that, um, you know, everybody knew that this is what I had done. And after I had moved and looking for work, looking for a way to, to get settled and start over, um, one of my previous clients called me and said, you know, are you really moving to Europe? And I was like, well, yes, I'm, I'm here. Uh, like, well, you know, we have a possible opportunity for you. I was like, oh, okay. I'm very interested. What is that? Um, and they said, well, you know, we're thinking about expanding our operations into Europe and we need somebody on the ground there to help us open the offices and build the network and, and really get the operations going. And would you be interested in doing that? You know, my wheels start turning and I'm thinking, oh, okay, job, visa, English language, people I know. Okay, yes, I can do this. Uh, and then he says, well, he says, there's one catch. I said, well, what's the catch? He said, well, we want the offices to be in Frankfurt, Germany. I had never been to Germany. I had never studied a word of German, knew nothing about the country, knew nothing about the language or the culture or anything else. But in my mind, I thought, okay, Germany, Spain, two hour flight, close enough, let's go for it. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I did. And so I moved to Germany really with, with two weeks notice, basically. Wow. Okay. But having an office, you know, based in Germany, 
yes, you could speak, providing the time difference was fortunate for you. You could speak to people probably at night, um, but it still meant you had to converse with other people somehow. Mm -hmm. Now, Germans probably, a lot of Germans do speak English nowadays, I'm sure. Um, but did you learn the language? I do. I speak German now. I'm still not business fluent, but but yes, I speak I speak German. It was actually the first thing I did. I had I had a German tutor and language lessons before I had a place to live. It was it was really important to me. It was always really important to me to integrate properly and to be able to to speak the language and to to be part of, of the community. So um, that was important to me. But and you make a good point, and I I didn't recognize this until I was experiencing it. Even being able to get by in English, there's so many things that you just don't understand and you don't know. Yeah. How to set up the, you know, how to get electricity in the apartment and how to set up a contract for the Wi-Fi and, um, you know, reading labels on groceries and, contacting the telephone company and all of these things, all of these things that I was very competent and capable to do in the US, I, I, could, I couldn't even read my own mail. You know, mail would come to me from the electric company or from the, the, the apartment landlord in German. Yes. And you know, even with Google Translate and everything else, like I couldn't read my own mail. And I thought, okay, this is like, I feel like I'm seven again. I feel like like a child learning everything brand new. Um, and it was it was really challenging for, for a while. I think it's one of the hardest things I've done. Yeah. And did you feel like giving up at any point? People kept asking me, because I would still go back regularly to the US to visit friends and family. And people kept asking me, they're like, oh, so when are you going to come back? When are you moving back? Yes. Or, you know, um, and it became as much as much as my ego took a blow by like just feeling really stupid all the time about not being able to not knowing how to do things. I think my ego would have taken a bigger blow if I'd given up and gone back. Right. Yes. I, I had told everybody, this is my goal. This is important to me. This is what I want to do. And yes. I never got to the point where I was willing to let go of that goal. Mm. I mean, that says a lot, I think, because it is, it is the ultimate challenge, I believe, for anybody to move to a country that is not native to them. And it's worse enough if you go to another country. I mean, in some cases in the USA, when you go to another state, it's like moving to another country, <laughs> right? <laughs> So exactly. <laughs> the fact that, first of all, it's on a different continent on the planet, it's totally different culture wise. And then having to learn and switch to another language and still be committed that this is your goal. So mm, it's really interesting. OK, thank you for that clarification. and and kind of confirming to us that if you really believe in something and you really want to you know achieve it then you can and obviously you're living proof of that so thank you for that right then so we then get to the pat so you you're so let's go wind back a bit so you're now working for this company in frankfurt germany mm -hmm. and tell us what happened next yeah, so then there was a series of events after that that's gotten me to, to where I am now. <clears throat> we tried with that company for about 18 months to establish business in, in Europe. Uh, and of course, I was learning as well, right? I was, I was no expert in, in how businesses operate in Europe and sales techniques. And, you know, I wasn't properly networked the way I was in the U.S. Um, yes. But I was learning quickly as I went. And, and at some point, I said, you know... The culture in Europe is so different and the business culture in Europe is so different that we're going to need to change the model in order for this to be successful. And at that stage, you know, they had already grown uh, large in the U.S. And 
they weren't prepared to change the business model just for you know this expansion into into Europe. And so we sort of you know collectively decided, okay, this isn't the right time for this. Let's let's pull the plug on it. And they you know invested in other offices back in North America, which meant that I was looking for a job again. Uh, yes. And um, by this time, I had a little bit of German, and I, I understood the culture better, and uh, and I was able to get a job at Jaguar Land Rover um, here in Germany, which oh, wow. was um, working for their European headquarters, which was fabulous. It was it was really a fabulous experience. I got to work with um, not only Germany but all the different countries and the headquarters, obviously in the UK. Um, yes. And, that really accelerated my learning curve as far as being able to get integrated, you know, not only in Germany, but also in Europe, because I was yes. working with people in, in all the European countries. And so I got to learn a little bit about how business is done you know, differently everywhere. Yes. Um, and that was really, um, it was really a great experience, but it got to the point where I was feeling really sort of, overwhelmed and burnt out and unfulfilled and I, I was just struggling with that with that work after after a while um, and so I made a decision uh, to pivot to a different a different type of work and really wanted to go back to doing my own thing again like I had done in the U.S. it's like okay well I'll go back into coaching and consulting and be you know an independent business owner because that allows me to set my own schedule and uh, work with the clients that I want to work with and really work in a more agile way. I think the most frustrating for, thing for me about large corporate, large corporate employment was it doesn't change very quickly. You know, it's not very flexible and adaptable. It's not very, not generally very innovative. You really have to, to work hard to, be innovative in in large corporate organizations yes. and that was frustrating for me i just felt like i wasn't making an impact so, no. so do you know what? i'm gonna make a change i'm gonna do something where i feel like i'm making more of an impact can contribute more to um helping people you know reach their goals improve their potential contribute to the world uh it really personally just became important to me um so I quit that job right before the pandemic. Oh, <laughs> <And> wow. <laughs> then, <laughs> then the whole training industry, basically three months after I quit my job, the whole training industry shut down. <laughs> yep. So I had some time on my hands uh, and um, a lot of time to really think about what my goals were. And I decided that I needed to develop some, some skills, right? I had been basically in the same industry and in the same kind of work for my entire career. And I thought, okay, well, this is the time to really develop my own skills and broaden my horizons and you know, improve myself, right? Yes. Which I think a lot of people kind of had that, that reflective moment in the pandemic. Um, so I made a very intentional shift and started doing a lot of volunteer work um, focused on um, entrepreneurs, startup organizations, um, you know, agile ways of working, digitalization, obviously, because everything went online during, during the pandemic. Yes. Um, and just really did a lot of, of self-development during that time. But back to your point about being brave. Also during that time, I thought, okay, well, you know, one thing that would really help me in the type of business I'm in, coaching and training, would be better storytelling. So I'm yes. going to work on my storytelling skills. And I found a university course about how to write a book. And I thought, okay, well, this could be really interesting. You know, I'll write a book and develop my skills at the same time. And um, so I signed up for this university course. And I had already this topic in my head of, you know, everybody, when I, when I announced I was moving to Europe, at first people told me I was crazy. And then I did it and they told me I was brave. And then I kept talking to more and more people about it. And there was always something following the, oh, that sounds really brave. There was the, I wish I could, but. Yes. And I heard that I wish I could, but mm. so often. And all the reasons that people 
weren't pursuing their goals, weren't pursuing their dreams. And I feel really passionately what you said at the beginning, I feel really passionately that everybody has in them all of the skills and talent and creativity that they need to achieve goals that are really important to them. Yes. And so every time I heard that, but I'm like, but of course you can, right? If I can do it, you know, just average, you know, middle-class college ed educated person from, you know, rural US, if I can do it, of course you can, right? Yeah. It's possible. And so that was the impetus for the book. So I did actually publish a book during the pandemic um, to, I interviewed, interviewed over 75 people about their stories, about sort of these impossible goals and how they achieved them. And then combined all of that into, into the book about how to really have the courage you know, to be brave and, and pursue that impossible goal. Wow. What's the book called, Vicky? It's called Life Beyond Should. <laughs> should, should. Because, because of all the shoulds, right? The excuses that people use or the reasons that they think they can't. Well, I really should wait until I save more money or I really should have a stable job. I need to be practical about this or, yes. you know, I, I really should, you know, this was the thing in California. You really shouldn't give up your career in order to start all over again. Yes. And all of these things that, you know, we're told we should do and we believe them. hundred <laughs> percent. So. Yeah. We, we think we should. Yeah, the shoulds, absolutely. It's, yeah. Yeah, I've been there, got the T-shirt, and yeah, I wear a different T-shirt now. I'm going to show you. So I, I, you can see the color of it. It's kind of, it's probably not coming across very well because of camera colors, but um, I wanted a T-shirt to support what's happening in Ukraine. And there were all these things coming out, like, you know, be brave like Zelensky. And um, so I, I did. I printed this T-shirt uh, uh, with, oh, nice. with the Ukrainian logo. <laughs> it said, be brave. <laughs> and we're not, are we? Generally, we're not. We're scared that something is going to happen and we're going to lose it all. And we're going to be either dead or live on the street. <laughs> and I always say, well, if you're dead, you're not going to know about it anyway. <laughs> so what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> so the, the biggest fear we have is that, you know, things are going to go so wrong. We're going to lose our identity, I believe, something that we've worked for for so long. I mean, the fact is that you've pivoted several times you've had to shake off your identity every single time and do something on your own and then you know go back into corporate and then shake that identity off again and do something on your own and yeah most of us just don't want to do it we've, we've become that identity everybody knows who we are we know who we are and we can't make that shift then either Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's very true. And you said a couple of really important things there. Um, you know, I think me personally, I'm one of those strange people that's uncomfortable in my comfort zone. So as soon yes. as I find myself feeling, you know, too much, like I have it all under control and everything's going smoothly. And you know, to me, that means I'm not learning. I'm not challenging myself enough, um, which I think is why I continue to put these yeah, these big challenging goals in front of myself. But I want to comment on what you said earlier about how we're, how we're so afraid of, you know, what could happen and that we're going to lose everything or that we're going to, you know, and there's, I mean, that's our brain protecting us, right? Our brain yes. is designed to protect us and keep us safe. So yeah. anything uncertain is the equivalent of, you know, a lion coming at us, you know, and we think we're going to die and, you know, everything's going to go badly. 
Um, but there's actually a strategy to overcome that when you're when you're any kind of a goal. It doesn't even have to be one of these big scary goals. It can be, you know, I have a presentation to do tomorrow morning and I'm nervous about it, or <clears throat> you know, moving, you know, something as simple as moving from one city to another or changing jobs. And it's worst case scenario. Yes. Because our brain automatically goes to worst case scenario. But if you let your brain go to worst case scenario, if you actually ask, what is the worst that could happen? Yes. And then start listing all the things that could happen and then think, is there something I can do about that to either mitigate or prevent it? Yeah. How likely is that actually to happen? Because of course we, we exaggerate in our brain this, this fear of how likely that thing is actually to happen. Yeah. And finally, even if it does happen, is it survivable? Like, right. Am I gonna am I gonna live if everything goes wrong? Am I still gonna live? And my big joke when I moved from Virginia to to California without a job, everybody said, "Oh, you know, you're gonna run out of money. It's so expensive there. You're never gonna find a job." And I said, "Well, I said, you know, California is warm and sunny, and so if I'm homeless, at least the beach will be a nice place to sleep." <laughs> <laughs> And my, my, my parents didn't appreciate that joke very much. They called me once a week to make sure I still had electricity. Yes. Um, <laughs> but in a way, that was what kept me going, because my worst case scenario was if I fail, I reserve enough money so that I can buy gas to drive back across the country. Yeah. And go back home and sleep on my parents' couch. That was the worst case scenario. And so in that mm. case, the worst case scenario wasn't really that bad. No. Yeah. no and that I, just makes it easier. Yeah. I, I, what you were describing is I saw Ted talk years ago where somebody was saying that exact same thing about planning for the worst. No, everyone always has a plan that, that is upside um never has a plan for downside the thing is if we have a plan for the downside there only ever is an upside because <laughs> 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 if you have a plan okay this is going to go wrong <laughs> what can i do about it nothing so that's all you know if you can't do anything about it so what you know but if you say well, if I don't do this, then something is going to happen. Then, yeah, you can do something about that. So uh, I do feel that it's it's in our power, right, to do something. Um, yeah, I, I, I really I really enjoy this thought process, really, that we're having about what is the worst that could happen and kind of getting the thread and un. un threading it and, and just seeing where it takes you um, because the likelihood is nothing is going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing is we're more averse to loss. Even what you're talking about, about giving up, you know, identity of like, I have built this reputation as this kind of person and this is my job and this is my, and we're more averse to, to loss, whether it's identity or money or, or security or whatever, than we are motivated by gain. And yes. so we automatically sort of blow out of proportion the likelihood of loss versus the probability of, of winning. And if we just realize that, if we just, you know, it, it doesn't keep us from, from thinking those thoughts, but if we just realize I'm probably over-exaggerating the possibility that this is going to happen, you know, yes. how likely is it really? Um, it just gives a little bit of a calming sort of, you know, more rational approach to, you know, to think really, I've got this, right? I can do this. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And what, what came to mind then as you were explaining that too is that this is a this is not my saying it's a tony robbins saying 
that I've heard that we do more to stay in pain. You know, if we're in a job and we don't enjoy it, we do more to stay in pain, not get out of that job, than compared to what we might do to move towards pleasure. Because mm. moving towards pleasure is scary. You know, so that that dream you have, which is the pleasure, it's so scary to move there because you've got to give up so many other things to be able to achieve mm -hmm. it. Okay, I would like to go back to your book. Mm -hmm. And did you, you, did you, I mean, you went on a course about storytelling, you said, uh, or book writing or something. So tell me a bit more about the course. How long was the course for? Uh, what did it give you? So it's, it's actually a complete book publishing beginning to end, like how to do your research, how to do interviews, how to create a storyline, ultimately um, working with editors to edit multiple revisions of, of you know, what you've written and you know, eventually publish the book. Uh, and I was really um, impressed. It's a course out of Georgetown um, run by a professor named Eric Koster. And um, it's a nine month program. And the, the funding for the course is funded by the book publication. So right. you don't have to like complete a, you know, a, an application for admission or anything else. It's just, you commit to publishing the book and then you've sort of paid for the course by publishing the book. Uh, right. it, was, it was just fascinating process. I really enjoyed it. And also the community that was created with people primarily in the U.S. because of course Georgetown is in the U.S. Um, yes. But but there were also people from all over the world that were you know, all online, all completely virtual, taking part in this course and taking part in these, you know, we had groups where we would share ideas with each other and brainstorm and, you know, occasionally just have those, you know, you know, sort of venting moments, but you had other people that were going through the same process with you. They're just like, this is going to kill me. How am I ever going to finish this? Thing? <laughs> um, so the community around it was, was really, was really fabulous. And I think that's what, what made it really come together because when I started, it was a very personal, I just want to learn some new things. Yes. I never really expected to published a book but by the time wow. it's so caught up in that community mm. that again seeing surrounding yourself with people that are facing the same challenges but that are also accomplishing the result right yes if they can do it i can do it and the more and more examples you see of people that are doing the thing that you want to do the more and more you believe that it's possible to do it right Brilliant. That's brilliant. That's, that's thank you for sharing that because that's awesome. And all in all, then, did you say the course was nine months? Did you start writing the book in that time? And how long did it take you to finish it? Yeah. So um, I think I extended by a few extra months, but you go from in nine months, you, you can go from idea to published book. Wow. Yeah. And it was much more work than I think any of us expected. Um, you know, the people that I'm still in touch with, you know, as we got to the end of that, that nine months, I think I extended to 12 months. It actually took me 12 months. Um, yes. By the time, and, and you have to remember, this is during the pandemic. So I wasn't working full time. I wasn't working. I mean, I was doing volunteer work, but I didn't have a full time job. Yeah. Everything was on lockdown, so I had nothing else to do. Um, trying to do this while you've got a full-time job, while you're taking care of kids, while you're doing, you know, I, I can't imagine, you know, but there were people that did it. There were people yeah. running businesses with, you know, two toddlers running around under their desk while they were right, and they still managed to get it done in, in nine to 12 months, yeah. But you also had to then interview did you say 75 people 
75 people. Yeah, maybe more than that, um, because I mean, 75 people that I actually captured all the interview notes and in, consolidated into the book, but there were probably more than that that were sort of anecdotal. Yeah. Right, right. Because that must have taken quite a while. I guess they didn't have anything to do during lockdown, so they were happy to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, yeah, they were, I was surprised, actually, because it was a lot of people I didn't know. I mean, these were strangers as well. Right, right? I put, yes. Uh, I just put the, the announcement out of this is the topic that I'm researching, and I would really like to talk to people that have this and this and this experience. And I was really surprised at the response I got from people who didn't know me and, you know, but were happy to share their story. I think because there is something where, you know, we all want to want to give back and make a contribution and, and have some kind of an impact. I think it's just sort of, you know, natural to, to have that. I want to, to make some sort of an impact and help other people. Yes. And I, that was the impression I got is, they had really struggled trying to achieve something in particular and they wanted to help make it easier for other people. Right. You know, for people to learn from what they went through so that, you know, okay, if it was really, really difficult for them, it may be slightly less difficult for, for the next person and slightly less, less difficult for the next person. And that sharing and, and wanting to, you know, wanting to help people achieve their goals was what came out in almost every interview. Wow. Amazing. That's great. Um, so how long has the book been out then now? It's been out a year. Um, and this was um, so a, a little over a year. So it published, yeah, June 2021. Um, and um, that was that was fun. That was just a lot of fun to put it out in the world. It was also one of those things that had that really high fear barrier. Yes. Uh, and imposter syndrome, right? Imposter yeah. syndrome. Who am I to say I wrote a book and wait, like I can't put this on, I can't put this out on social media because my professional identity, right? People know me as this corporate manager, and suddenly I've got this book with this crazy title, and what will people think? And yeah, so yes. there was a, a huge hurdle to overcome. But I finally just said. Yeah, back to worst case scenario. I was like, well, what's the worst that's going to happen, right? People can laugh. <laughs> so yes. Just, yes. Just put it out there. Um, yeah. And how was but it received? I, it, well, this is this was part of the thing that they didn't. It wasn't obvious in the in the in the course. Like you think there's this big long term goal of of writing and publishing a book. Yeah, I think, oh, okay, I've achieved that. I'm done. And especially, I mean, you know, up until 3 and 4 a.m. in the morning, writing and revising and editing, and, and, and then you get done, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm finished now. What they did tell us, but didn't really sink in, is there's this whole next piece that is yes. promoting the book and marketing the book and you know, doing interviews and... And I, I, I will say, I just wasn't prepared for that. Um, so it was really well received. In the first couple of months where I was really promoting it, I got lots of um, great feedback on it. I had people tell me that they actually, like somebody that um, was inspired to take a sabbatical and go uh, on a three month cycling tour through Europe um, after she read the book. And so oh, uh, I got wow. a couple of stories like that of people that had these bucket list goals that were you know, always in their back of their mind, like, I would really like to do this. And then they, they would write to me or tell me, it's like, I, I finally decided to do it. Now I'm going. So that was fun to see that impact. Um, but then, to be fair, I stopped promoting it. Um, right. after, after a couple of months, I just needed a break. I needed a break from, you know, from that focus. Uh, yes. So, yeah. Okay. So what's the, okay, what's, what's the, so you, you've had a bit of a break. Are you still on that break or are you, I mean, obviously being on the, being on the podcast, we're talking about it. So that's promoting it. Right. Yeah. So no, I actually, I've, I've started, I, I decided at the one year mark. So last month, June uh, of this year, I decided, okay, that was a long enough break. I really, yeah. I wrote this thing for a reason. I think it can help people. I really believe in the message and I want to get it out there. 
Uh, and so I did start promoting it again and start talking to people about it again um, within the past couple of months. Um, and in the interim, what I did also was uh, made another career pivot. I, I mentioned that I was doing a lot of volunteer work for, you know, entrepreneurial yes. organizations and, and startups. And so I also started working for a startup out of Berlin um, that does um, leadership development coaching and um, yeah, digital, digital coaching for customers worldwide. And so I really got um, very motivated about the way the two tie together right, to be in the leadership development and the coaching space and to see the impact that as a business that can make, yeah. but then also on a personal level to start promoting the book again and sort of carry that same message to individuals rather than, um, yeah, rather than business, uh, business managers. So. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, okay. And obviously by you, doing the research and interviewing all of these people that have, you know, been listening to their stories and their journeys. Did you, um, if there were, if there were even just one or maybe a few more than one, let's say three things that you got from it personally, you know, apart from, you know, the whole journey of the book writing, but actually the content, because mm -hmm. I always believe that when we're, say, teaching or we've done research on information and we want to share it with others, in the process of sharing, we are also learning, right? Mm -hmm. So what did you learn from the content in the book that you've written? Uh, it was, so you said two or three things, and I really learned two completely different kinds of things, because in addition to the interviews, I also did sort of fact-based research, science, like what's the science behind this, and why do we react the way we do to fear, and how do we overcome it, um, and so some of what we've already been talking about, about how our you know, our, our, the thought processes in our brain are designed to protect us and, and actually keeps us from achieving our goals. And that was just fascinating for me to just recognize all the, the biases that we have when we think we're trying, when we're doing our best to accomplish something and how we're getting in our own way, basically. Yes. yes. Um, so that, that sort of, there is science behind why we face the the barriers that we face and there is things that you can do about that so that was really really a big learning for me on a personal level the interviews i interviewed um one man named darian and he said something that still sticks with me and i love it and what he said is most people give up if you don't give up you're already ahead of the majority <laughs> And that was just, I was like, you know, that is so true mm. because really you think you're competing with everybody in the world, but you're not competing, whatever goal you have, if you want to start a business or, you know, um, maybe personal goals, like bucket list goals, like going on a cycling tour, you're not competing with anybody, but you know, starting a business or things like that, you think, oh, there's all these other people that are better, faster, smarter than I am. And yeah, they're going to be successful and I'm not. He's a drummer, he's a musician, uh, and he's played now worldwide, Carnegie Hall, he goes on worldwide tours, but he told me about the journey that he took to get to that level of success. And he stood outside of clubs in New York in the freezing cold in December, listening to music through the windows because he couldn't afford the cover charge to get into the club. Wow. But he was just listening and learning and building relationships and talking to other people until he could finally get in and, you know, start talking to the other musicians and getting gigs. And that was what he said. He said, I could have given up. He said, it wasn't fun standing outside in December. It wasn't fun playing for free in Central Park, you know, every Saturday and Sunday for, you know, two years. But he realized that if he just stuck to it, 
he was already in the top 10% because 90% had given up. Yeah. And I'll never forget that. <laughs> wow. I love that you share a drummer story because uh, I'm a drummer too. And oh, oh, I did kit drumming when I was a teenager in London in like a punk band. Yeah. And I, we gave it up. All of us gave it up. And I never held on to drumming. And I was very sad about that. And if mm -hmm. I had ever, if anybody said, do you have any regrets in life? I don't. But that was the only one I would say, yes, I regret it. I gave it up. But a, a few years ago, um, my wife and I met a new friend standing in a queue to go to a personal development day. And this guy invited us down to the south of England, in Devon. And he showed me a video of him doing Japanese taiko drumming in mm. a stadium uh, on, a, on the pitch for a rugby match, uh, at the beginning of the rugby match. And I went, what is that? I've never heard of it. And how do you do it? And where can I do it? So when I came back to where I live in the Midlands, in the middle of England, I found a teacher and I got into it and I've been playing it now for nearly four years and really? I'm loving it. Yeah. So I'm back to drumming again. So even if you give up on your goals, <laughs> they may come back and visit you in the future. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great story. I love that. Yes. And well, and it goes to, I think, you know, we all have those things that are really important to us because, of course, there are some goals that you probably should give up on, right? But it just means yes. that those goals aren't important to, you know, they aren't aligned to your values or to your long-term vision for your life or other things. Um, and it's the goals that are really, that are really attached to what we want to get out of life and what we value for ourselves. Yes. Those are the ones that you want to hang on to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what's the, what's the next step? I'm curious, what's the next step for you, Vicky? Uh, the next step for me is uh, really to build the business that I intended to build at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, now using the book as sort of the, the step stone into that business, which is, you know, personal coaching and consulting uh, for people that want to achieve you know, what I call non-traditional goals or, or follow a non-traditional path, people that want to move to another continent or do a career pivot or you know, go on a sabbatical and backpack through Europe or whatever. Now, the, the goals that people feel like they shouldn't pursue because they're impractical or impossible. Yes. My mission now is to help people realize that they can achieve those goals and help them to find strategies to do it. And so um, in addition to my, to my career in, in corporate coaching, I'm really uh, passionate about pursuing the individual coaching now as well. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And so please share with us, how can people get in touch with you if they would like to do that? <laughs> Okay, so they can find uh, me most easily and the book uh, at lifebeyondshould.com. Okay. Um, and there's a, there's a contact form on the website, which also has my email address on it. So I'm always happy if people email me directly. Uh, if anybody wants to drop me a message uh, through that contact form, I'd be happy to send them a signed copy of the book. I love getting feedback and finding out what resonates for people. So I'll offer that to your, to your listeners. If anybody just drops me a message on the website, happy to send them a copy. That's um, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it's because um, there are still more stories to hear, right? And I want to know from the people that are interested in the book what their story is as well. So absolutely, uh, yeah. I mean, I've been doing this podcast for nearly six years, and yeah, there are there are stories all the time. Your story and many other stories um, like yours or different, and yeah, in some way. I, I hear those stories about what people have, you know, overcome and 
like what you've had to overcome and, and deal with, which is just incredible. Um, Vicky, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you would have liked to have shared? Um, no, I guess just as a, as a sort of parting thought to wrap up the whole, the whole topic of, you know, how to, how to really design the life that you want for yourself um, is I think it's important to be aware of the expectations you're fulfilling and do a check-in on whose expectations they are, right? Yes. Are they your expectations of yourself or are they the expectations of how you were raised or your job or your friends or the culture that you live in? Because those are all the shoulds, right? Those are all the things we should be doing. And a simple question of, is this what I want for myself or is this somebody else's expectation of me just gives us a different perspective. So that would be the parting thought that I would, that I would leave people with. Um, and also another way to find me uh, where I share just more little um, insights about those kinds of things is uh, I'm on Instagram at more to life. So M O O R E to life or yep. more to life coach. So people can always get little um, yeah, tidbits uh, and inspiration uh, for those kinds of things. Fantastic. I'm so glad I asked the question because I thought that was brilliant. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Um, uh, you know, I'll make sure all the links are in the show notes so people can find that contact form. They find you on the social media and get in touch with you and learn a little bit more. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. It really was a pleasure talking with you. It's just, uh, yeah, so much fun to share. So thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye for now, Vicky. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.